This video will discuss how to optimize parameters related to resolution. What you see in this image is a snapshot of a sample that consists of uh, very thin cells grown on a glass cover slip, which are stained for actin uh, in an Alexa Fluor 488 fluorophore, uh, Mito Tracker in a fluorophore that's similar to Alexa Fluor 594, and DAPI for the nuclei. Um, so this is a well-balanced image where I've optimized all the parameters here in channels and the speed, direction, and averaging to get a really nice uh, quality image as far as contrast goes. But there is a problem with this, which is that contrast is not the only thing that we care about in terms of the quality of the image. Another thing we care about is the pixel size relative to the size of the objects we're interested in. So in this case, for example, we are interested in mitochondria. So let me highlight them and explain what the problems are with the way the image was acquired. If I go here and I click on the single channel, it will show me one channel at a time. And if I click here, it will show that particular channel in the range indicator uh, display mode. So if I zoom in, which I do by scrolling um, on the mouse, and then if I move by pressing the scroll wheel and dragging, I can explore the sample. And you'll see immediately that there's a problem with the way that I've acquired this, which is that if I were interested in the mitochondria, uh, one of the issues I'm having is that the mitochondria are represented by very few pixels, and so they look very chunky. So this would compromise um, any uh, attempts to segment the mitochondria later on because there would be a lot of um, noise relative to sort of the positions of the pixels. So clearly um, this pixel size that I'm imaging with, so the size of one pixel and the area that that represents in the image is um, sort of too big. So what do we do? Um, when we uh, when we encounter a situation like this. And so uh, I would say that you can break this question down into two aspects. The first is, what should the pixel size be? So how big should one of these little squares that represents a certain area in the sample, how, how big should those be in theory? And then how do we change it in practice? So in what follows, I'm going to, to discuss um, both of those aspects. Let's tackle the first question. What should the pixel size be? This depends on the size and spacing of your objects of interest. So for example, if you are interested in nuclei, you don't need really small pixels to be able to discern where they are. On the contrary, if you're interested in mitochondria, as we were discussing before, you really need a pixel size that is smaller than what we have right now. So I go into significant detail into this issue in my confocal lecture, which is a video that you can watch uh, as part of training on this instrument. Um, let me just show you the two most relevant slides for this, which is um, if you were to count nuclei, for example, this level of pixelation is perfectly uh, sufficient, whereas this might be overkill. On the other hand, if you need to study mitochondria, this is completely unacceptable, and this, while better, is still insufficient. Um, so that's the first thing to consider is, you know, what pixel size do you need? Uh, related to this, there's sort of a maximal, uh, you know, level of detail that you can get just based on optical constraints, which again, I explain uh, in that lecture. Um, and if you're curious as to sort of what that um, maximal level of resolution, so what that minimal pixel, pixel size is, it, in the Zeiss software, you can play, uh, press this button uh, that says confocal. Uh, now, note that everything we've done so far is still confocal, so I, I consider this button a bit misnamed. But if you press this button, the system will do a few things that we'll discuss later, but here in pixel size, it will tell you what it thinks is the minimal pixel size that will allow you to get the maximal resolution. And that depends on the wavelengths of your fluorophores. Um, so for example, when all our uh, fluorophores are checked, it is basing this uh, number on the shortest wavelength, which is DAPI. So that number is 0 0.07 microns, uh, or 70 nanometers approximately. But we've, if we were only imaging with others, it thinks that that number um, can actually be slightly higher. Then um, this is just based on some optical considerations. Uh, as a rule of thumb, I would say that you should not aim for pixel sizes 
uh, smaller than 70 nanometers because while the pixel size will be smaller, you won't actually get any extra detail. It'll just be empty magnification because you'll be beyond the um, limits uh, of what the microscope can optically give you in terms of discerning details. Um, so that gives you a sense of you know, what, what pixel size you uh, you sort of you might aspire to in the extreme of trying to get the maximal resolution of your system, uh, but also that you don't always necessarily need to do that, um, particularly if you're operating with sort of either lower magnification objectives. Right now, I'm using a 63x 1.4, so that's about as high as it gets in terms of magnification and resolution on the system. But if you're using a, a lower mag objective, you typically don't need to maximize the resolution because you're typically looking at things that are uh, much larger and more spaced apart. And so you don't really need to push things to their limit. So clearly pixel size is a really important variable. Um, so let's discuss now how you adjust it, what things you can do to change that pixel size. Um, so I'm going to turn off this confocal button uh, and I'm going to go back to a preset of 512 by 512. I will later explain what all this means. Um, but I want to point out the four things that are interrelated and are very important for you to understand to uh, be able to flexibly change the pixel size to whatever you want. So the four things that you need to understand how they work and how they're related to each other are the zoom. So this is a slider that goes from one to a much larger number. I think it goes up to 40X. Uh, the image size, the pixel size, and the frame size. So let's explain what these are uh, one at a time. So I am going to use as a as a visual aid uh, this thing called stage. So this is a, uh, a visual display uh, on the image that allows you to see where we would be taking an image if we hit snap right now. Uh, it's not something that you will use um, in the course of normal imaging, but it's useful to illustrate some of the concepts here. So let's start um, uh, by discussing what zoom is. So zoom means whether the laser scans through the sample in a large area or in a smaller area. For example, if I uh, change the zoom from 1x to 2x, you can see that the laser will only scan over this small area. So if I were to snap an image, it would only be of that smaller region there. You can see that here. Uh, well, I, I drifted out of focus, so let's go back into focus. There we go. And try that again. So you can see that this snapshot is only of this small region. So if I go to single channel and the mitochondria and put them in range indicator and do best fit, you can see that this is very clearly this area. So the zoom changes the region over which the laser samples, uh, the, the, the region over which the laser uh, travels in the sample, um, and consequently, you know, the size of the image that you get. So that's the next parameter, which is image size. So you can see that the zoom is something that I can control, but the image size, I can't type numbers in here, uh, but this is immediately downstream of the zoom. So the image size is not the size of the image in megabytes, but rather how many uh, microns in X and in Y are represented in the sample by this image. So for example, the current image size with a zoom of 2X is about 50 by 50 microns. If I were revert to revert back to a zoom of 1X, you can see that the image size is about 100 by 100 microns. So while I can't type numbers uh, in here, I can control the image size quite simply by adjusting the zoom with this slider here. What is the frame size? The frame size is, again, something that I can control. I can type whatever number I want here, whatever number I want there. I can use some presets. Um, and what these, number mean, what these numbers mean are the number of pixels that this image has in the x dimension and in the y dimension. So if I were to zoom in, you can see that the image is made of individual pixels that are represented by these little boxes. And these pixels represent um, how much light came from the location represented by this box. This means, the frame size, 
that there are 512 pixels in the x dimension and 512 pixels in the y dimension for a total of about a quarter of a million pixels in the complete image. Finally, we have pixel size, which is not something that I can double click and type a number in, and, but this is ultimately what we're interested in in terms of resolution. And where does this number come from? This number comes from taking the image size, which right now is about 100 by 100 microns, and dividing by the frame size, which right now is about 500 by 500 uh, pixels. And that's how we get uh, a pixel size of 0 0.2. It's 100 divided by 500. So what that means is roughly that one pixel represents an area, an example, of about 0.2 by 0.2 microns. It's not exactly that, but that's the idea uh, for what this number means. OK, so um, those are how all these things are connected. Uh, let's reemphasize. Uh, this with a few diagrams from the confocal lecture that I mentioned, uh, which I think will help um, illustrate this issue. So let's re-emphasize these concepts once more. We have a sample. We look at that sample through a microscope, and that generates an image. That image has a certain size, which represents the area of the sample that is in the image. So that image represents an area in the sample of x microns by y microns. The image itself has a certain number of pixels in x and in y. The pixel size is uh, obtained by dividing the image size by the frame size and represents the size that one pixel um, represents in the sample, in this case, x sub i microns times y sub i microns. And the zoom is the scan area of the laser and determines the image size. And of these four parameters, the zoom and the frame size are the ones that are directly user controlled. Now, of course, if we manipulate them, uh, we can also change the image size and the pixel size. So for example, uh, if this is our starting point and we increase the frame size, that will lead to smaller pixel sizes that cover the same image size. Um, this will also lead to slower imaging because the laser needs to visit more locations and more bleaching because there's more laser per unit area. If instead we modify the zoom and, for example, increase it, <clears throat> uh, then we are imaging a smaller area in the sample with the same number of pixels, um, and therefore the pixels are smaller. And this will lead to more bleaching because we have a higher concentration of laser uh, light per unit area. So with all of that in mind, what is the recommended workflow? First, we want to determine the pixel size we need. And this is going to be a decision based on the size and spacing of structures of interest, as we discussed before. Second, we want to determine the image size we need. And this decision will be based on the size and the spacing of experimental units. So for example, if we want to fit one cell in the image, the image size has to be big enough that we can accommodate that. So as it says here, you could be interested in cells, you could be interested in organelles, in tissue structures. You just need to fit the thing that you're interested in into the field of view. Now, once we know those two things, we can set the zoom to get the desired image size and then set the frame size to get the desired pixel size. And finally, uh, we want to make sure that once we do all these things, all these things are going to affect the speed, the contrast, and the bleaching. And so we want to go back and check that those are um, all within a range that we consider acceptable. So this is how you do this in theory. Let me show you in practice what buttons you need to press and different ways of doing this when you actually have uh, a sample and are imaging on the confocal. So we are back on our image and back in the confocal software. What do we do? Let's say that what we want is a pixel size of 0.07 uh, micron, so 70 nanometers. So we want to maximize the resolution. Um, so that's one thing that we want to achieve. Another thing we want to achieve is to fit this entire cell in the field of view. So if that's the case, um, you can see that we can't zoom in because if we were to zoom in, we would not be able to fit the entire um, cell in the field of view. Hence, to get to a pixel size, of 0.07, we would need to do it exclusively by increasing the frame size. 
And so we would need to increase the frame size by about a factor of three. So if we went to about 1500 by 1500, to make the pixel size around three times smaller, we need around three times more pixels on each dimension. And so now, if we said snap, and before that, I'm going to double check that this has not drifted. Okay, it drifted a little bit. I'm still equilibrating to the temperature of the room. There we go. I am going to now snap an image. And this is an image uh, of the same um, cell that we had originally, but with higher resolution. So how can you tell it's higher resolution? I'm going to um, just highlight the mitochondrial channel and I'm going to zoom in. roughly the same amount to the same area. And so you can see this is where we started in terms of resolution, and this is where we are now. So you can see much more detail than in our starting image, um, which is precisely what we wanted. So this would be one approach. So another approach would be to say, well, um, actually, I don't need uh, the entire cell because I only care about the behavior and mitochondria in these cellular extensions. I'm just making that up. I don't know if that would be true or not. I'm just making it up because I want to highlight um, another approach to this. So that other approach would be to say, I actually only care about a really small area. So the area I care about is something like this, maybe just a 20 by 20 uh, region, excuse me. Uh, where am I? A 20 by 20 uh, region there. Now, if I need to acquire just an image of this size, I don't need 1500 <clears throat> by 1500 pixels. More likely, I need something like 120 by 120 to get to the pixel size of around uh, 70 nanometers. So obviously, I made some mistake in the math. Yeah, it's more like 270 by 270, I would think, or even a little bit more yeah so 300 by 300 so clearly i made some mistake in my arithmetic um let me double check that this is still in focus there we go uh, and i'm just going to snap an image here so you can see that this image has excellent resolution but it's on a much uh sort of smaller portion of the sample because we've zoomed in. On the other hand, um, it is uh, was acquired much faster than this large image. So what you do depends on um, you know the image size that you're interested in, the pixel size that you're interested in. Now, um, you know, the arithmetic tripped me up here. I obviously made some dumb mistake. Uh, but if you if you sort of don't want to deal with that arithmetic, uh, that's when this confocal button comes in handy. So I'm going to go back to 1x. I'm going to go back to 512 by 512. Um, I'm going to recenter this here. Whoops. I always had to click and not double click. Um, so if you press this button, what the microscope will do is calculate the pixel size that allows you to have the maximal resolution and then set the frame size to reach that pixel size for the given zoom right now. So if I press confocal, it calculates that the optimal pixel size is 0.07 and it makes the frame size whatever it needs to be to get the, the uh, appropriate pixel size. And while this is highlighted, so while this is in blue, if you change the zoom, it will dynamically change the frame size to keep the pixel size constant. So if I go, and zoom in by a factor of two, it will automatically change the frame size such that the pixel size is always constant. So this is a very useful way of circumventing the arithmetic. Um, and if it and, it and it operates in the case where you need your pixel size to be uh, the minimum uh, because you, you, you want to get the highest possible resolution image. So let's say that we've set this up under these conditions. Um, the final step, if you recall from the from the slide that I showed before, is to just check <clears throat> that um, that the speed, the contrast, and the bleaching are acceptable. 
um, because you'll notice that when you change uh, the frame size and the zoom, the pixel time can change, uh, and certainly the area over which you're scanning changes. So that can have an effect on things that we, you know, adjusted before related to contrast, um, and certainly can have an effect uh, on how long things take and on the bleaching. So how do we check those things? So I'm going to go uh, to a condition like so, and, and I'm going to show you, um, you know, how, how we check those things. So I'm going to do this uh, just with one channel, just to illustrate the general principle. To make sure that uh, we're using all the settings that are here, we can't use live. Live is sort of a quick and dirty imaging condition. If we want it to do exactly all the things that we say here, we need to use continuous. So I'm going to click continuous, and we're going to see here, um, in the range indicator display, um, how that looks. So in terms of contrast, it looks good. We can see a little bit of what looks like aliasing here. Uh, that is sometimes a sign that the bidirectional is not operating perfectly. So we can try and see if, if we turn that off, if that improves. And you can see indeed that that removes that slight um, I don't know. I mean, if you're not um, if you're not at the highest resolution watching this on YouTube, you might not be able to tell. But I'll show you again. There's a little bit of sort of aliasing, like um, every other line uh, is a little bit uh, different. Uh, so you can see the, the sort of like the lines a little bit. Um, but if you go to unidirectional, that goes away. Uh, it's worth checking whether maybe we can get away with bidirectional and reducing the pixel time. Uh, the pixel dwell time just a little bit by dropping the speed. Um, but that does not seem to do the trick. So this is a case where if we wanted the maximal precision, it would be best to do it in unidirectional mode. The other thing that we want to check is that we are not uh, bleaching this significantly on the time scale that we want to image it for. So if I go to histo, um, we can draw a little box, for example, here. Uh, and this will be the intensity of the pixels that are inside this box. Uh, the arithmetic mean intensity is here. Uh, so that's just the mean, the, the sort of standard mean. And you can see whether this number is going down and how quickly it's going down. So I've been speaking for about 20 seconds about this, and it's gone down very little from 2,550 maybe to 2,470 something on average. So uh, bleaching is really not a concern here, but this is something you want to check. And if you see that there is uh, bleaching, um, you may need to change your imaging settings and trade off quality or um, resolution or time uh, to have less bleaching. So the way you could trade off time, for example, is you could reduce the laser power, for example, here by a factor of two and increase the averaging by a factor of two. Um, that will usually lead to less bleaching. Um, so once you have everything in the state that you want, um, then you're ready to image. And you can do that uh, simply by taking snapshots or by doing more elaborate things that I will cover in subsequent videos. So for example, for this case, we could take a snapshot. And this would be um, uh, optimized both for contrast with all of sort of these things uh, and for resolution with the settings in this part of the software.